Have you ever wondered what would happen if you combined the parry mechanics of Sekiro with Dark Souls with a tight level design of Demon Souls in a gothic Bloodborne setting? Close your eyes Come to me Feel alright Just dance with me all through the night Turn it off Close to you I feel good Cause I just know feeling of you Give it to me baby Feel alright I feel good Just want you step with me Dance with me, you will me feel alright I feel good on you, alright To make a group all Elden Ring's combat mechanics on the deepest sense are better than Lies of P, no questions about it. But if we're gonna compare Lies of P with any of From Software's offerings, we should be looking at none other than Sekiro. Make no mistake, not only Lies of P is the harder Souls experience in comparison, but I can also confidently say that I've never played a Souls game where the parry mechanics were significantly better implemented in a Souls format. Lies of P as Novisa Studios' first effort was not only an exceptional Souls in the general sense, but also by From Software standards. If we look at this in a spectrum where the parry-focused gameplay resides with Sekiro on the one hand, and the dodge-focused gameplay resides in Elden Ring on the other, 
lies of P resides somewhere here. Retaining the weapon variety, spacing and positional play in Souls design while being highly parry focused in its core design like Sekiro and doing all this simultaneously. In a Bloodborne setting with the rally system and sidestep mechanic with the rich level design full of shortcuts like Demon Souls to boot. An interesting game design where the developers attempted to bring together the strongest aspects of all From Software games in a single package. The question is, how successful is this attempt? The reason why Lies of P is and will be compared with Sekiro is simply because the parrying lies at the core of its mechanics. Just because it uses sidestepping and health regain like Bloodborne does not make them directly comparable, and its parrying is not even the same as Sekiro. I would suggest to you in fact that it is a noticeable improvement. Just to give some context, I'm a Souls player that intrinsically prefers dodging and uses heavy colossal weapons in favor of parrying and dex weapons. This is usually my style and it's one of the reasons why I love Elden Ring so much. It gives me that flexibility and freedom with the mechanical depth in its boss design from software has perfected over the years. And if you've played The Lies of P, you would know how problematic its design philosophy supposedly would be for me in theory. See, dodging is not directly punished, but discouraged in Lies of P. The developers want you to stay toe-to-toe -to -toe with the bosses and learn their admittedly demanding and delayed attacks to be rewarded with a posture break. And using heavy weapons like Colossals is also not directly punished, but discouraged as well. To understand why, I need to explain how staggering works. This is a new and original posture breaking system that Lies of P brings to the table. When an enemy attacks, you can do a normal parry if you keep pressing L1, but this results in slowly losing health with each successive hit. You survive, but you don't gain anything on the mechanical level. Instead of holding, if you can press L1 in the exact moment the attack contacts your blade, you can do perfect parry. This allows you to not only lose health with just a little bit of stamina cost, but more importantly, perfect parry allows you to slowly chip away at boss's stagger meter. But before we get to that, the window for a perfect parry is not very generous, and most enemies like to deceptively wind up their attacks. Not as much as Elden Ring, but still, just so that you need to have a precise understanding of the boss's patterns to perfect parry the delayed timings. If the precision from software requires you to perfect parry in Sekiro is this much, then the precision Lies of P requires is this much. When you look at this footage and compare the perfect parry timings of both Sekiro and Lies of P, I think it's clearer to see what the actual problem is. Lies of P tightens the parry windows to the actual contact point of the blade whereas Sekiro gives a much looser and easier to execute timing where even if you press it many frames earlier, it would still register as a perfect parry. This is an objective way to see how much more challenging it is to pull a perfect parry in Lies of P. The problem for many is that Lies of P did it right, but everyone wants a more loose parry window like Sekiro just because From Software did it. But that's a fallacy, that doesn't mean we hold Sekiro's mechanics on a pedestal. Lies of P's timings are more intuitive and precise. And this more challenging perfect parry timing was just one of the improvements Lies of P brought to the table on an objective level. Just like in Sekiro, if you can fill up the stagger matter, you can have a chance to do a posture break. This stagger bar fills up by doing perfect parries, fable arts, heavy charged attacks and overall by keeping up the aggression. If you run away too much and only look for obvious punish windows with occasional perfect parries, it will be way harder to stagger the bosses. In Lies of P, unlike in Sekiro, 
an additional skill check has been integrated to make this process significantly more demanding for heavy weapon users like myself. When the stagger meter fills up, health bar of the boss will be highlighted with a white border for several seconds. This doesn't mean you've staggered them, but now you have the chance to do so. The white border only stays so for a very short period of time, and then it resets. And while you see this white border, you have to do a fully charged heavy attack with R2 to get your posture break. Unless you make this charged attack contact the boss before the white border disappears, you will never posture break a boss in Lies of P. While in Sekiro, all you need to do is to keep perfect parrying to get your punish. You don't even need to attack that much. You don't even have to reduce the HP bar of the opponent. In Lies of P, you need to not only perfect parry, but also do a fully charged R2 at the right time to get your posture break with the intention of actually depleting the boss's HP bar. This adds a significant level of challenge from the foundation Sekiro has laid out, and this is for multiple reasons. First of all, keep in mind that aggression is reinforced. Just like how you can gain HP by attacking after guarding and taking damage, so can the enemies. Some of your damage output is actually merely temporary in Lies of P. If you run away too much and play passively, the enemy will slowly regain a percentage of the health he supposedly lost. To make your damage permanent, you need to deliver a posture break and keep up the aggression. What is really interesting is that in Lies of P there is no protective poise system for most attacks. Not even if you use one of the slowest and heaviest colossal weapons like an Elden Ring. In fact, one of my favorite weapons that I really enjoyed using is this big pipe wrench for most boss battles in Lies of P. However, once you actually get into it, this weapon has a variety of shortcomings. Although it has one of the highest damage outputs in the entire game per hit, an incredible fable art, its charged R2 is extremely slow. In fact, it is so slow that some bosses in Lies of P are almost not possible to get a fully charged R2 without hit rating a little. This means if you're not extremely precise, you can never posture break with big pipe wrench without taking a hit. Isn't this unfair? There simply isn't enough time to execute this crucial attack for certain bosses. Well, not exactly. The developers, keenly aware of this limitation, has added something called Patient Smash as its special fable art. These are unique special attacks all weapons have that can only be unleashed if you have perfect parried enough times and stored enough power to use it. And guess what this fable art does? It allows you to tank a single hit from the boss while you're charging it. It gives you the poise that is necessary to get your fully charged R2 in case the boss is not allowing you to do so by normal means. And don't get me wrong, this is a very rare occurrence. With the exception of Romeo, which we'll get to soon, Walker of Illusions, and maybe with the Nameless Puppet, the slow nature of this charged R2, of this particular weapon, was not a showstopper at all. But it was precisely so because the developers have added this unique Patient Smash weapon skill. This is a very hard weapon to use in general due to its intrinsically slow nature, but it's technically viable and also satisfying when you do get your posture break. Post stagger you can do what is called a fatal attack by pressing R1 on this red marked location. However, before doing so, it is a good idea to at least do a normal attack or even a heavy attack first. Usually the boss doesn't recover instantly and if you don't waste time, you can not only get your fatal attack, but do so with a higher baseline damage multiplier. The reason why I say this is that Lies of P is an extremely challenging game, much more so than even Sekiro, and you need all the damage output you can get regardless of your build. See, in games like Elden Ring and Sekiro, provided the boss has a second phase, Either it is within the same health bar, or if it does have a second phase with a new health bar like Melania, Wait.
It is usually 80 to 90 percent similar to the first phase with some additions and modifications to the existing moveset. I have never played a Souls game that requires you to learn a completely new boss moveset in the second phase or a significantly altered one like in Lies of P. I'm talking about the King of Puppets and Romeo. Until this point I was still in my first blind playthrough and I was doing a challenge run with no vitality upgrade which means my character dies in one or two hits due to having no health. On top of this I was also doing a no weapon upgrade to make the game even more challenging. Now don't get me wrong I did struggle throughout with this build already. Fallen Archbishop Andreas took me two separate play sessions to get through. Especially this gang fight with the Black Rabbit Brotherhood made me literally rage quit and delete the game only to re-download it in a few hours. I couldn't just let one frustrating gang fight to get in the way of what I can potentially experience with this amazing game. I re-downloaded and I kept going and got to this cool place. Little did I know the King of Puppets which was admittedly a fun and cool boss fight has nothing to do with Romeo, the second phase. Unlike in Sekiro when you beat Ishin, you now fight a modified Ishin as the next phase. In Lies of P the developers expect you to learn a completely new and fresh moveset, separate from the first phase, effectively a new boss fight without a checkpoint. And Romeo is one of them. After doing a really good job in King of Puppets, my big pipe range is now extremely slow in comparison to Romeo's agility and speed. So posture breaking is harder than usual and I run out of potions because I simply do not know all the intricacies of his moveset to perfect parry, especially with such a low health bar. Now the developers actually allow you to summon a helpful AI controlled NPC called a Spectre to reduce some of this pressure but I have only used it for two gang fights in the game. I feel like in any one to one boss fight using specters similar to Elden Ring summons does not work on a mechanical level. The AI is incapable of juggling both threats simultaneously. So the question is what gives? Is this even fair for people who don't use specters? How am I gonna learn a completely new moveset for the second phase? First of all, let's call spade a spade. My health was extremely low at this point for a blind playthrough so first order of business I have started grinding in the spot so that my vitality was around what a normal player would be at this part of the game. Once that's taken care of I still needed to look into how I can actually execute a posture break on Romeo with less risk. Now this is a point where the game's very impressive weapon variety kicks in. Not only there are various decks and strength weapons to choose from but also a completely original mechanic called altering handles to change the length, moveset and fable arts of many weapon heads effectively creating even more original attacks and fable combinations depending on your needs. Remember we all played Sekiro with a katana, that was it. The entire game was learning its timings. All of its bosses were specifically tuned for those katanas, while Lies of P enables the use of multiple types of weapons with unique timings, attacks and fable arts to make all of those still viable with all the boss movesets. Now that is significantly more challenging what Sekiro even attempted to do on a game design perspective. And I can safely say Lies of P did a phenomenal job here. I have used like 20 plus weapons in my playthrough all feeling really enjoyable most of the times having a fable art or a unique charge attack that makes them memorable and unique. And with this in mind I've decided to use another weapon that scales with strength while having a bit of a faster swing than my pipe wrench and it did work out really well. I had options, I could choose and I'm still baffled how a nobody studio was able to create this much variety with this existing boss AI complexity. Speaking of bosses, Lies of P's overall lineup is extremely strong, not only varied but also mechanically rich to boot. 
I want to talk about Sekiro a little bit here because compared to Sekiro where although bosses are certainly the main attraction, it is very interesting to me that when looking back on the game, I remember only a few boss battles that truly impressed me on a mechanical level. Genichiro being one of my favorites in the game along with Ishin. I also enjoyed Father Owl, True Monk and Hellless Gorilla to a noticeable degree but unfortunately the rest weren't quite on par for me. In fact, for me, Sekiro had such an inconsistent line of bosses that I found the rest as mediocre at worst and average at best. Bosses like Folding Screen Monkeys, Masataka Oniva, Corrupted Monk, Divine Dragon, Demon of Hatred, Chained Ogre, Juzo the Drunkard, Shinobi Hunter Ancient of Missin, and Blazing Bull to just to name a few. Let's be honest here, in Sekiro the amount of high quality bosses that truly leave an impact on a mechanical level is few and far between. And in a game that boasts with its bosses, that's not a good look. And on top of this, in such a short game the mini bosses are constantly being reused over and over and over again. Lies of P doesn't do this. See, Elden Ring had a huge open world, countless bosses and 130 hour runtime to redeem those usage of repeat bosses. Sekiro doesn't have that excuse. Now on the contrary, when I look back at Lies of P's bosses, I remember a much more consistent and mechanically rich lineup. First of all, Scrapped Watchman was a very solid, instructive and enjoyable beginner boss fight. It had delayed attacks, which was a bit of a nod to what is to come later into the game. Much better than both Chained Ogre and Masataka Oniva from Sekiro. I also think the Cross City was a really good level for a beginner section as well. It is the weakest level design in the game, but still incorporated some elements of upper and lower levels, some secrets that rewards exploration, and most importantly, some nice enemy placements that keep you on your toes. The next boss I want to take a look at is King's Flame. Fuoko. I have personally loved him and this was the exact moment when I started to see the potential in Lies of P. Not just the specific boss itself but the actual prior location I was traversing from a level design point of view. See, Venini works in its tunnels gave me a visceral deja vu of the sewers below the Lindel capital in Elden Ring and it did so in the best way possible. It was multi-layered, confusing, complex, full of shortcuts and cool locations to discover with items. And capping it off with Fuoko was just icing on the cake for me. This encounter teaches the player to not always create spacing as the boss can make your job way harder with projectiles, but you also can't mindlessly attack aggressively as it also forces you to create spacing with his area of attack, Flame Burst. It is a boss that not only integrates the scrapped watchman's delayed attacks but adding the elements of appropriate spacing to the mix. A great next step in the boss lineup. This was the point in the game where I was truly getting captivated by the game's rhythm. And if you think this impressive level design ends here, well you'll be dead wrong as the next stage, Saint Frangelico Cathedral was an absolutely incredible location to traverse. We first start with the outskirts, slowly making our way to the tower, which was reminiscent of Demon Souls' Gates of Boletaria for a moment there, leading to a very well designed, tight climbing section full of enemies you need to keep in mind while making your way up the tower. In this decay filled cathedral, it was really enjoyable to see how interconnected and well made the level design was leading up to my first serious roadblock in my adventure. Fallen Archbishop Andreas. This guy's second phase was a showstopper for me. I was running out of potions and it had almost a new moveset I needed to learn. This was definitely a taste of what was to come soon. The decay was constantly reducing my weapon sharpness and my health, combined with the already minimal healing items at this phase of the game, learning the second phase was even harder. 
I can easily see someone being so frustrated at this part of the game that they drop the game entirely. I have persevered however and got my win. The first phase was definitely easier to predict and understand. After a while all I needed to do was to get a feel for the second phase. However, I can't say the same for the next boss on the list. Black Rabbit Brotherhood, the bane of my existence, my least favorite fight in the game. In general, I don't like gang fights in Souls games. Even the good examples like Ornstein and Smoke from Dark Souls 1 or Valiant Gargoyles in Elden Ring. Something about how the developers balance the AI always feels off to me. And Lies of P is no exception. Even though this gang fight have its redeeming qualities like focusing on the Elder exclusively to bypass his minions altogether if he can smoke his HP quick enough, or being able to backstab the minions, these are all cool, but I still would have preferred an actual mechanical challenge like the bosses that came before. Now we've already discussed King of Puppets and Romeo, one thing I want to mention though is that Romeo has a very challenging second phase within his own HP bar. He fires up his weapon with flames and starts this insane long combo extension that requires you to be very precise in your answers, or you can find an alternative technique which is what I've done to circumvent this particular move. I was running and dodging forward into Romeo's momentum on the side and this allowed me to not get damage from his attacks. Romeo by himself is already a novel and serious challenge as a second phase boss, but this potentially lethal flame combo being added into its own HP bar was another tier of craziness in my opinion. And to be honest with you guys, I loved it in a twisted masochistic sense. This was definitely one of the harder bosses in the game for me, but it really opened my eyes to what developers can really do with bold decisions. And with that, we get to the Grand Exhibition. This was another really well-made multi-layered location that actually stumped me a long while until I realized the trick was to aggro this particular enemy here and survive for long enough in this room full of enemies until he breaks the door open for you to move forward. Now this was a completely original idea that I haven't seen the game utilize before. Great job on the level designers front as they kept doing new stuff that surprises you throughout the adventure. Many Souls-like games at this point would take the lazy route about 50% into the game. Lies of P is such a well-crafted game embracing its linearity on a structural level that, just like Demon's Souls, this allows it to never get boring and always have the capacity to implement novel ideas consistently. That's why I love Demon's Souls level design and that's why I love Lies of P's level design. Now this Victor fellow was a really fun, brute, physical boss that reminded me instantly of Batman Arkham City and Asylum games. I don't know if you played those games, but they also utilize the specific color palette and enemy design a lot. Now I hope at this point you're appreciating the boss variety that this game offers. It is both mechanically and visually varied. Especially in a second phase, Victor starts doing these punching combo extensions and it definitely has its challenges if you don't know how to react to the delayed attacks. This leads to the Barren Swamp, which is probably my all-time favorite swamp level design, even taking into account the well-made Demon Souls and Dark Souls 1 swamp locations. Lies of P aced the level design for me here. This was absolutely mind-blowing. From large, expensive locations to tight spacing-focused levels, lots of spaces to explore, find new stuff, timing focused obstacles on your path, capping all this off with my favorite swamp gooey boss in Souls games, Green Monster of the Swamp. Wow. I usually do not enjoy these sort of enemies in Souls games. Demon Souls boss design isn't usually its strong suit, but the swamp bosses there was plain bad in comparison to its own standards. Dark Souls 1 similarly had an average swamp boss in Blight Town with Chaos Witch Quaylag. But this one right here, it wasn't just a great swamp boss, but just as mechanically rich as the rest of Lies of Peace catalog. In fact, 
I fell in love with how there's a delayed final attack in his second phase, preventing a careless punish immediately. I also loved how it forces you to stand toe to toe directly facing him and if you dodge sideways trying to circumvent his attacks, he will punish you immediately with a swing, something you will naturally avoid if you are facing him, as a result safely starting your charged R2 punish. See, it is these small things that make me appreciate the boss design in Lies of P. It is challenging but fair, if you understand the core mechanics. Next on the list is the Corrupted Parade Master. This was another fresh boss because periodically it would spawn these minions to his aid. It wasn't overly difficult this time around and that's good because after the green monster, I actually needed a timeout to get my bearings straight if you know what I mean. The next location led to another one of my least favorite bosses in the game. Another gang fight with the Black Rabbit Brotherhood. However, this time around I had a lot more health, called in the Spectre to evenly split the aggro to make the fight more bearable, and another advantage that I utilized was to use the Puppet Ripper's unique charged R2, which is a crowd control spin attack. This made sure I could flinch and poise break all three enemies if they were caught in my area of attack. This helped my Spectre to stay alive longer in the fight until the Eldest arrived and we finished them off afterwards. And now leading to another one of my favorite level designs in the game, the Arch Abbey. This is the final dungeon of the game and with its length, mini bosses, complexity and sense of finality really hit home for me and made me look back on the game with a nostalgic feeling. So many ledges, jump scares, challenging enemies waiting to ambush you. This is how a final dungeon should be made. Especially this mini boss door guarding was really cool. You could only damage him properly if you can stagger him by hitting at his leg. Nothing too challenging but another nice variety to the boss lineup. However, you might say something is missing, we're almost at the end of the game and rightly so, where's my Genichiro Inishin? Well, that's a really good question. Lies of P covers you on that front as well. This following boss is my absolute favorite in the entire game. In terms of a variety, aggression and complexity, I have enjoyed her so much and loved what this encounter brought to the table. From software, better buckle up because Laxassia the Complete was absolutely incredible. This is a boss fight that can actually stand toe to toe with Genichiro and Ishin on a mechanical level. The first phase composed of slow swings that accommodates heavy slow weapons like Big Pipe Wrench, but the second phase, where she goes berserk in her full glory, yeah, this, this is gonna be a problem. Although I wasn't perfect with all the parries and dodges, I want my own gameplay footage to speak for itself this time around.
The next boss on the list is Simon. And although this was a simpler boss in comparison with delayed attacks, its second phase was simply no slouch as projectiles and area of attack spells were combined with his first phase moveset in an aggressive manner. I'm not even counting how epic the cinematic phase transition was where Simon was slowly touching the fingertip of the arm of God and channeling its power in the second phase. Which leads us to the most interesting moment in the game. The finale, the moment we've all been yearning for this entire time. The moment where Geppetto, our father, desires for our beating heart. See, this entire journey was filled with countless emotions Pinocchio has gone through. Anger, frustration, happiness, sadness, joy, anxiety, the entire shebang. The sheer fact that our puppet nature subtly but surely had been replaced with the human emotions was a testament to Pinocchio's special nature. And right around this moment, right when Geppetto was looking at us with anticipation, I felt a sense of unease. I felt that this person I was trusting the entire game, Geppetto, had an ulterior motive. I didn't quite understand what it was, I didn't quite understand the disconnect, but because of that feeling I wasn't sure what to choose at this moment. And as you can see in this footage, as I was trying to make a choice, I actually ran out of time and my choice was locked without my consent. I have accidentally rejected Geppetto's offer. Thinking I've made a mistake, I was prepared to restart the checkpoint to not get a bad ending, but to my surprise, Geppetto has slowly shown his true colors. How we were merely a means to revive his actual son, who had already died. See, the entire existence of Pinocchio was just a sham. It was all to serve the nameless puppet, being animated by his father Geppetto with the power of Ergo, for one last attempt to get our humanity by force. This is the true ending of Lies of P, an ending that I've accidentally stumbled upon and I'm happy I did because the Nameless Puppet was a boss fight that I would be very sad to miss out on. Just like Lexasia, I think it would be better if I let the footage speak for itself. This was a worthy farewell to one of the greatest Souls games I've ever played.
You're just a useless puppet. If you've enjoyed this analysis, I think my deep dive into Elden Ring's philosophy of struggle would be of interest to you. Don't forget to subscribe because my next video will be very interesting and I wouldn't want you to miss out on it. As always, thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.